All right, today we're going to jump into Ethereum and also what could be the connective tissue for how e-commerce will be done in Web3. You're going to love this one. Make sure and stay up because it really paints out a very interesting picture of how Web, web and e-commerce will be done in Web3. All right, my name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Let's get into it today. Uh, before I get started, I do want to thank our sponsor, and that is Quantum Miami. Quantum Miami is a big event being held here in Miami. It is kind of the Web3 and blockchain event of the year. Make sure and check them out. They've got a ton of stuff going on. Lots of great speakers, sessions from all around the world. Myself, I will be there at Quantum Miami, so make sure and stop by. I'll be uh, moderating a couple of events and a couple of sessions, and then we'll be doing a ton of interviews. So if you see me, make sure and stop and say, hey, Paul, we love your show, all that good stuff. We have a special offer for you guys, though, and it's only available to the PBN community. All you have to do is click the link below in the description. That'll get you a discount on your own ticket over to Quantum Miami. A lot happening over there in terms of some pretty great stuff. If you just look here at a little bit of their speaker lineup, you've got Andre Cronier, which is, of course, the Phantom Lead Dev. Uh, you've got, of course, Mr. Francis Suarez, I would say the number one mayor in the country, and a ton of great speakers in the, in the Web3 and blockchain space. So make sure and check them all out. Oh, there I am, yours truly. Uh, as I said, you guys want to catch me? That's where you can do it. All right, let's get into it today. Don't forget, use the link below. It's going to help you. Let's get into it today because there's a lot happening here around Ethereum and what might look like a potential for what the future of how e-commerce is done. And you guys have heard me talk about this quite often is that the problem with blockchain in most cases to be able to integrate to uh, Web3 at its fullest level, e-commerce is going to be the threshold that you have to pretty much cross. If you look at some of this data coming in from uh, this Aete uh, Novarica, uh, they did an interesting report here, and I want to focus in on this thing here, which is really just how many people uh, set up and automate recurring and repeating payments. This is one of the key things, 35%, as you can see, of people that are doing this in the current Web2 platform out there, what we know as the internet today. That may be on the cusp of about to change. And what I mean by that is Visa has come in, and let me kind of scan up here to the top of the uh, proposal, uh, of setting up auto payments for self-custodial wallets. And there's a lot that they are proposing through the ETH Foundation and just in general. Let me zone, uh, zoom in on a couple of things. Uh, if An example that they kind of propose is if, hey, if you're away on holiday, who's going to generate the signature, create the transactional uh, to make the payment? This is a problem that I've seen and had in my own businesses here to where we can't set up auto recurring payment. It's like an event. You have to go in and do these kind of things. This is problematic for what the future of where this could go. Ethereum supports push payments but doesn't natively uh, support pull payments. And that's kind of the crux of where this uh, really blows into the auto payments uh, aspect. So pull payments being auto payments, uh, any kind of recurring system. Example of what we do on our own mastermind and our own CPI membership of why we can't utilize that for monthly memberships is, and even annual memberships, is we can't do any type of auto recurring uh, payments. So it's a big problem in the industry. One of the things that Visa is trying to do here, if you notice what they state right here, let me zoom out on that just a hair. Um, what they're talking about is account abstraction. Uh, it's a proposal that attempts to combine user accounts and smart contracts into just one Ethereum account by making these user accounts function like smart contracts. This would be brilliant. Uh, it would enable uh, multi-owner accounts, which means multi-sig verification. It also enables the use of post quantum signatures for the verification of transaction and also for a so-called public account from which anyone could make a transaction by removing signature verification entirely. So there's some interesting things that the Visa is proposing. I think Visa sees this. If you look at just this, um, you know, kind of this layout right here of how they see the ERC and sorry, ERC20 and uh, the smart contract connection and what this means to creating these auto payments along with the tie-in to the merchant website. Because remember, right now, the merchant website 
is the go-to model here. When you do any kind of auto payment, it's essentially tying into a merchant website that that merchant website is then acting as the e-commerce trigger to be able to handle those pull payments that is in compliance for that particular contract. This gets into a very interesting scenario where this could really uh, start to displace a lot of the old Web2 e-commerce tools which is something I've been talking about for quite some time. This is going to be the killer app that truly becomes a utility aspect of where Web3 will be going. Further into their breakdown here is talking about the transfer, the actual payment itself. So uh, dealing with permissioned uh, execution for auto payment and smart contract, and then the tie-in back out to the merchant website, which then of course ties into the individual wallet. So there are some interesting aspects to this that Visa has really put a lot of thought process into, and I think they see kind of the writing on the wall is that this is coming and it's not going to slow down. So uh, it's something I think is going to continue to flow into this. Now, where could this start to flow into application uses? If you look at just the media and publishing side of things, we look at that, obviously, since as a publisher. Uh, newsletter, publishing, and the future of Web3. This is going to be one of the key areas, I think, that NFT subscription models will become the gold standard for future Web3 publications and all publications of content. And there's some things that they highlight into this, um, into this article. Let me zoom out on this. So NFT space has been shifting towards membership and utility and away from static artworks. We know that. Uh, this obviously derives the disruptive technology and it's providing uh, to disrupt just about anything can be considered a digital asset. There's a lot of potential in memberships, news, media. Media heavyweights like YouTube, Twitter, even Coachella are finding ways to use NFTs. We'll see more of that uh, integrate, I think, into everyday media. And then for subscription, subscriptions, we're excited that by the idea there's no, no one ever that has to cancel their subscription, meaning they can just sell it to someone else. And then the royalties would go forwards to the funding of the publication. So uh, this, to me, starts to change the entire idea of what subscriptions are. Could you imagine subscriptions that were in limited nature and what those values would be, which not necessarily could be the case, but there could be a lot of business models that start to create some very innovative ways to publish content out there. So lots happening uh, around that. Now, there's a couple of companies that are already turning uh, these kinds of elements into customers. Here is a company called Hang, which is .xyz. Uh, they basically take your customers and they build on a community basis and they, they go into a little bit of about offsetting uh, the customer acquisition cost, which is the CAC, which is a big problem right now of being able, for any publisher out there, really any you know, web and you know, web two company in terms of trying to obtain a customer on the digital side is the uh, customer acquisition cost is a big deal. Uh, this could really start to play things that are very interesting because it could start to track customers across all touch points. Now, I want you to think beyond just the aspect of, hey, this has plugged me in to my wallet. Now I'm moving in other places across the web, much like what SSL and some of the tracking devices that are happening in Web2 that kind of jump into our privacy side. This could really change where a lot of this is going. Loyalty programs could be a kind of a multiplayer experience, so gamification of loyalty programs. This is something that Starbucks is already trying to do, and most likely, well, I think, will end up doing some pretty interesting things. You can get into subscription programs, a free-to-join program, uh, reward most loyal customers, start to build on benefits. You can go into tier-based program. They have a lot of interesting aspects of where this is going, and this is just the first of many companies that I think I think will start to move in to where the evolution of Web3 is going in terms of maintaining that digital connection to the customer, but yet still giving the customer full control of what they're doing from an NFT standpoint. Now, the other aspect of this that could start playing to, into this is streaming. And if you look at TV streaming providers now should start relying on NFTs. There's some that are already kind of gone down this uh, path. Here's a little bit of data here. We can do uh, we can do all of this today. You might say, well, you're not doing it entirely wrong. Possibility for Netflix, for example, is to create interactive subscription services for, specific, for specific type of content is something that's entirely possible. Uh, so this would be, first it would kill 
the massive credit card fill out form, all that process that we go through, and all of this lethargy that you deal with in Web2, which is usually, I mean, you, you guys know, you, the hoops you have to go through to sign on, use Google, OAuth, auth, authorization if you're using social, whether it's uh, something like a Facebook or a Twitter, sign in with. I think mass adoption will be uh, a huge opportunity here. But in this kind of scenario, it would be more of an um, all-you-can-eat or nothing approach uh, for regular subscriptions. So creators would be able to package up content for particular NFTs or incentivize particular vape favor or behavior. Uh, and this might be things like watching all episodes in a short time frame, you know, more of that integration and more gamification. This could also play into the movie rollout passes, series, all sorts of things that could apply into this that could be subsets of what our current subscribe subscriptions are. And again, it gets back into audience engagement, community building, and possibly even ramping up the amount of services. We've already started to see this being done. I've seen this done in things like meal kits and things of that nature where they do those add-ons and it's very intuitive. Imagine if this was done in more of a gamification way because I could see this happening in all sorts of subscription-based services. Think about your coffee services, your meal kit services if you're using something like a Blue Apron and those kind of things. All of this plays into what this might look like in the future. Very cool stuff. Now, this company is actually already out there trying to do this for Netflix. So uh, Revuto is basically trying to do exactly that, and that is building an NFT platform for things like Netflix, Spotify, et cetera, and building it in a way. Now, the the likelihood, not that I'm knocking on this company, but the, the likelihood is that this will most likely be built into the native platforms, meaning Netflix is most likely gonna do this, YouTube will likely do this, uh, Google will likely do this, Amazon uh, will likely do this. I'm curious as to what podcast platform will take the first lead. Don't count Apple out. Still biggest podcast player out there. Could become a whole new way to develop NFTs for podcast distribution and audience participation. So a lot happening here in the content side of where NFTs are going. And the biggest problem you have, as you guys know, is this whole issue with uh, sign-in. And sign-in may be a very interesting and possibly changed format in everything we've ever experienced around signing up for and maintaining that sign-in capability across our Web3 connectivity. So why sign-in with Ethereum is a game changer. This is an article that was done by Spruce, and they, they cover a couple of things in here. Instead of submitting to like the big login, which is like Google, etc. Users can now log in using the same keys controlling your blockchain accounts without any intermediary. You don't need someone else to control you. And the other aspect to that is now you can do a uh, connect wallet versus sign in. I think this, of course, is the way to go. Connecting a wallet is an incredible, you know, you know how that's plugged into the DAP. Remember, uh, remembers nothing about you and it establishes pretty much a very quick and simple interaction in the front of a sign up uh, opportunity. Further in the article, they kind of break it down, unifying the sign in with uh, Ethereum. So uh, you'll find many existing services offering sign in with Ethereum, but not many, uh, but not many as a standard. They'll also typically use this to establish a cookie-based session with the user, so it can it, it can manage privileged metadata about the account. Again, more problems on data tracking, which I think also complies with a lot of the GD, GDPR situations that are occurring in Europe. Most likely going to happen here in the United States. Right now, at this point, instead of presenting the user with arbitrary block of text to sign. The wallet can present a friendly stylized interface. Boom, feels good, removes any doubt, and you're in. And I think the slickness of that, you controlling the experience, you controlling the data, and you controlling what you want to engage with becomes a huge part of Web3. The specification also introduces additional security requirements, which is gonna be another big you know, uh, part of this, such as domain binding uh, to prevent phishing attacks, um, and this, of course, will completely eliminate replay attacks, all that. Some of these are the very situation that we're dealing with in Web 2 is the amount of fraud and phishing attacks and all of the problems that are wrought with Web 2 have been building up over years. Web 3 may 
completely eliminate that kind of snare. Now, sure, there will be breaches. Sure, there will be ways in which this can be manipulated. And that most likely will come from highly advanced. I think you're going to create a whole new layer of, of cyber criminal out there. But in essence, that's also good because it creates a threshold so you don't have you know, tens of million criminals that are coming at our system like they are right now. Maybe it's only a few, and now it's much easier for government authorities to track them down and help protect us against that. Authentication is another thing. Uh, imagine a world where instead of an app holding your user's data, you would be completely in control of all your user data. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> Complete control of all your user data. I think that right there uh, pretty much sums up what Web3 really is. Further into this, um, I wanted to show on, you know, as an example, you know, the Ethereum Foundation already has the sign in with Ethereum. So you can actually do this now. And the problem is, is that not many companies have started to util utilize this use case. And it's going to be kind of a chicken and the egg thing. You know, we're going to wait for a few key companies to start to roll this out or start to see, you know, application use cases, use cases being deployed. But it will not be long before we start to see how e-commerce is going to integrate with Web3. And I think the first few companies that do it are going to have some pretty cool success. All right, so here's an example of Nifty Chat, and we'll just show you uh, the Connect Wallet feature there. And you'll see, this is how quickly and easily you can jump into any one of your Ethereum-based wallets. So it really creates a very unique and new type of user experience. And this is one of the things I think that we'll see more and more on a lot of the Web2 platforms. Further into this, let's go into this. This is the, uh, I think this was by Vitalik. Uh, he goes, I would suggest you guys take a look at this. Uh, just go over to his blog, vitalik.eth.limo. And these were the three things he was most excited about. So number one was money. Uh, first and still the most important application, obviously that being, um, everybody knows that, how it's used, etc. cetera, stable coins, uh, ERC20 tokens, all that good stuff. I won't go into the, uh, the deeps. The second was uh, the DeFi side of things. And that I think everybody has learned because of what's happened with FTX and all the others. DeFi has been kind of the central point and shining beacon. And number three is this whole idea around the identity ecosystem, which is I think going to be one of the key things that starts to leverage into what Web3 offers. So a lot more proof of and verification, a lot more control of your own data. This is the future of how the internet will work. And this, I think, is one of the things that people seem to be missing because everybody asks me all the time, Paul, this is great, blockchain, 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 but what's the real use case? What's the real use case for making this happen? This is the use case. So now we have a video up here that's just like, okay, let's paint you through this process. Just go back through all of the things I just mentioned and then apply it to any XYZ business out there. Preferably these member-based or loyalty-based, can't you imagine just about every retailer in the land is already in that space. Every media company in the land is already in that space. Every retail direct-to-consumer product in the land is already in that kind of space. So the other aspect that you look at is this whole situation with Bitcoin, because Bitcoin, of course, has been struggling to get to a layer two. So here you've got the layer two labs guys going in and basically saying, hey, give us a little love here, man. We need to have a side chain. So what they're proposing is we have six side chain designs in development already, including two of which are exact clones of Ethereum. Um, and they, are, they basically are trying to improve the Bitcoin UX, and this is one of the big problems. The other issue is there's a lot of infighting right now, which you guys know this, and we talk to a lot of Bitcoin, Bitcoiners, we'll call them, that just don't want to listen to this potential opportunity. And this is something that I think they're going to have to get to to be able to leverage into where we see Web3. And Bitcoin could be part of this. So it's just a matter of, not, uh, of whether or not we can see this happen within the Bitcoin entities uh, themselves. And just to give you an example, um, you know, William Cligley, we've had on the show before, and this is a good example. Here's, a, here's the Wax Cloud Wallet. While this is the old model, which is really Web 2 and Web 2.5, you have to go in and, and basically create a wallet with one of these platforms, in which now 
this platform could enable a situation where you no longer have access to your wallet. You're no longer in control of it because you signed up through Facebook or you signed up through Google or you signed up through you know, Twitch or Twitter, whatever it might be. Point being is that you no longer have control, full control and custody of that wallet because of the sign-on process that you've created versus a wallet connection that's direct in a Web3 platform application. Now, hopefully you guys understand why we do this show, why we think that Web3 is the future of not only technology, but of business, of commerce, of all things that are privy to the next generation consumer, which is gonna be all about identity and ownership of not only their, their own data, but also their own digital assets without a third party being in the way. This is really the future of how Web3 is gonna be going. All right, so you guys are listening in over on the podcast side of things. If you'd love to learn more about this, make sure and drop some comments below. I always love, love to get your feedback on it. And you know, our researchers do a ton of work on this. We really try to understand some of these things because all it takes a lot of times is to understand what big companies, remember, go back to where this started, right here on Visa. This is what Visa is trying to do. This is their team thinking around crypto thought leadership. When you have companies like Visa, when you have big finance companies that are starting to see the writing on the wall, they're starting to put the pieces of this puzzle together, now you get it all. Make sure and drop some comments below. If you haven't subscribed over here to our YouTube channel, this is the number one place to do it. Jump in, very easy. Just hit subscribe and like on a few videos that will help you out. Of course, if you wanna reach me, just reach me out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.